I'm everyone and no one. Everywhere, nowhere. Call me Dark Man. Greetings, fanboys and fangirls. I'm Erod, and I'm the Blockbuster Buster. Before Blade rolled onto the scene, there were very few comic book movies that I liked. In fact, the only comic book movie that I liked before Blade was The Crow. But there was another film that was very close to the genre that I liked so much, and it wasn't even based on a comic. Dark Man. Long before he became the man famous for bringing Spider-Man to the big screen, Sam Raimi was better known for being a cult horror director, more specifically for being the creator of the Evil Dead franchise, which I hold so dear. Swallow this. Fresh off the success of Evil Dead 2, Raimi decided to pursue a more ambitious project and take his first venture into the superhero genre. At the time, Universal had laid claim to the Shadow, and the powers that be were trying to get a film based on the mysterious hero off the ground. Apparently, Raimi lobbied long and hard to direct the Shadow movie, but the producers of the film felt that Raimi's ideas were just too dark for the type of Shadow movie that they wanted to produce. So Raimi applied his ideas to a new concept, a new movie, an all-new original superhero, Dark Man. The Secret Origins of Dark Man it all began with Peyton Westlake, a scientist that was desperately trying to develop synthetic skin to replace burnt or damaged flesh. The problem is that synthetic skin is photosensitive and it will melt after 99 minutes of being exposed to direct light. However, it holds its composition indefinitely in the darkness. As Peyton desperately tries to discover the formula for permanent synthetic skin, his girlfriend, attorney Julie Hastings, inadvertently gets a hold of a document called the Bella Cyrus Memorandum that could potentially implicate her boss, Louis Strack Jr., of some dirty zoning deals. Julie accidentally leaves a memorandum in Peyton's lab, where Strack's goons show up to collect it, but not before they murder Peyton's assistant, torture Peyton, and leave him to die in a fiery explosion. Miraculously, Peyton survives, but is terribly burnt, to the degree that the doctors don't feel that he would be able to survive the pain of his injuries. So they sever all the nerves in his body which allow his brain to receive sensory input, meaning he can no longer feel pain. This has a strange side effect though. As the brain is being starved for input, it feeds off of Peyton's other emotions, meaning his rage, paranoia, depression, and sadness are amplified. And when he gets angry or scared, the adrenaline rush is so intense that he momentarily gains the strength of 10 men. Now Peyton has nothing left but his desire for revenge and his drive to one day discover the formula for permanent synthetic skin so he can rebuild his face. So he uses his newfound super strength and his ability to assume anyone's identity through the use of his synthetic skin to hunt down the men who destroyed his life. Crime has a new enemy and justice has a new face. Dark Man. Favorite character. This is one of those rare old genre movies that has a really impressive cast. Colin Frail plays Louis Strack Jr., and he does a fantastic job of playing the most unbelievable yuppie prick. Just a few days after Peyton's alleged death, he's already putting the moves on Julie. Unfortunately, there's no cure for grief. But there is something that eases the symptoms. It's called dancing. But my favorite Strack moment is when he has Julie over at his office and he just so happens to have the Bella Cyrus memorandum, which his goons took from Peyton's lab just laying on his desk like it's no big deal. You have nothing on me. You'd find the extremely expensive police department quite unsympathetic. What an asshole! Oh, and just in case you didn't recognize her, that is super actor Frances McDormand playing Julie. I wish they would have given her more to do in this film outside of just being the girlfriend, but hey, she moved on to do better things, and as usual, Frances performs admirably. One of the absolute greatest characters in the movie is Strack's main henchman, Robert G. Durant, played by legendary genre actor Larry Drake. In my personal opinion, this is by far one of the greatest roles he has ever played. Durant is one sadistic psychopath. No more Mr. Nice Guy.
Alright, let's talk about our lead, who's not just my favorite character in this movie, but one of my all-time favorite characters, Darkman. Believe it or not, Sam Raimi initially intended for Darkman to be played by none other than my favorite actor, Bruce Campbell. And as awesome of a prospect as that might have been, the studio didn't see it that way, as they wanted a more seasoned and better known actor to take on the role, so it went to Liam Neeson instead. Now as disappointing as it might be that my favorite actor didn't get to play one of my favorite characters, I have to give credit where credit is due, cause Liam Neeson is pretty damn good in this part, playing both the awkward obsessive compulsive scientist and the insane and horrifying dark man. His most impressive moments are when Darkman dons the synthetic skin to momentarily become Peyton Westlake again. Liam is still playing the neurotic, socially handicapped outcast, and he never lets you forget for a second that that is not Peyton. It's just Darkman wearing a mask, which is the most important aspect that makes a superhero unique. As most superheroes take off their mask to become their secret identity, Darkman is the reverse. He has to put on a mask to become his. Favorite scene. One of the elements that made me fall in love with this film as a kid was that this was one of the first films that I ever saw that mixed the genres. This isn't just a superhero movie, it was a true blue horror movie, with plenty of nods to The Phantom of the Opera, House of Wax, and Dr. Fives. There is nothing heroic or romantic about Peyton's ordeal and his eventual transformation into Darkman. It's a tragedy, plain and simple. While the film may have its funny moments, like most of Sam Raimi's work, the humor is pretty dark and twisted. For example, we have the opening scene which is one of my all-time favorite scenes, which sees Durant and his boys meet up with a fellow crime boss named Eddie Black. After Eddie relieves Durant and his crew of enough weapons to start their own mini-militia, Durant reveals that he still has an ace under his sleeve, or should I say pants leg. Yes, that man had a loaded machine gun in his prosthetic leg. That is awesome! The scenes in which Darkman begins to stalk and take the identities of Durant's men so he can kill them and sometimes trick them into killing each other are great. Not to mention suspenseful, since Peyton only has 99 minutes before the synthetic skin starts to melt. But the absolute best of these scenes is Ted Raimi's, cause as usual, Sam's little brother gets it worse. favorite scene is when Durant and his boys attack Darkman's hideout. The sequence begins with the henchmen making their way through a series of elaborate traps Darkman has set for them, followed by a great rooftop chase, all of which culminates with a hair-raising helicopter ride, with Darkman hanging at the end of a steel cable. All the shitty blue screenshots aside, this is one kick-ass action sequence, with some really impressive live stunts. Kudos to the camera team and the stunt team. This is unbelievable, not to mention a huge precursor to Raimi's work on the Spider-Man films. Excuse me. Incidentally, this is also the sequence which includes the obligatory cameo of Sam Raimi's Oldsmobile, which appears in nearly all of his films. You can't have a Sam Raimi film without the classic. I will be blown away if he manages to sneak the classic into Oz the Great and Powerful. Favorite line. While this film is far more driven by visuals and Danny Elfman's beautiful score, a few good lines did manage to slip through the cracks. I'll get that myself! Hey, what about the flare? Beat it! Oh, you gotta be shitting me. You have been But my favorite and funniest line in the movie comes from a scene which clearly explains why you don't cheat Darkman at carnival games. Uh, the pink elephant, please. I'm sorry, buddy. It don't count unless you're behind the line. What? I was behind the line. Not hard. <laughs> I was standing right here with my girlfriend. Now, the pink elephant, if you please. No way. It doesn't matter, Pete. It matters. I won. Pink elephant for my girlfriend. 
Why don't you just uh, get lost, pal? Elephant. Quickly. Didn't you hear me? Weirdo. No? What do you mean, no, woman? He just tossed that guy like a salad. Take the fucking elephant doesn't sound that demanding, considering what he could potentially do to you. I guess this is further proof that Francis McDormand has ovaries of titanium. The Dark Man Legacy. While Darkman may not have as strong a franchise as Batman or Spider-Man, he does have his fan base. This is evident by the fact that toys and comics were produced based on the character. And in 1992, Sam Raimi and long-term collaborator Robert Tapper did try to get a Darkman TV show off the ground. A pilot was made, but no network ever picked it up. If you're curious to see it, the pilot is available on YouTube. It stars David Bowen as Darkman, who admittedly looks a little bit like Liam Neeson. They made quite a few changes to Darkman's mythology. Like for example, in the pilot, Durant is solely responsible for Peyton's attack, and there is no mention of Strack. Julie was not Peyton's girlfriend. She was his wife, and she died in the fire that turned him into Darkman. The pilot is not bad, but it's not great either. You can see why no network wanted a part of it. It just lacked the heart and edginess of the film. This I can only recommend to hardcore fans. More notably, two straight-to-video sequels were produced in the mid-90s, starring the mummy himself, Arnold Vuslu, as Darkman. Yes, I know, Arnold looks nothing like Liam Neeson, but Darkman does have the power to change his face, so there you go. These movies aren't terribly spectacular, but they are very entertaining, and they are definitely a must-see for any alleged Darkman fans. The first one is Darkman 2, The Return of Durant. I think the title says it all, guys. Durant is back and he wants Darkman dead. Now, as far as how exactly did Durant survive crashing his helicopter into the side of a bridge, that is never explained. But frankly, I don't care. Ignoring the details makes it worth it to see Larry Drake play Durant one more time. And my god did he relish the opportunity to take on this character again. His performance alone makes this movie worth seeing. Colombian friends today, Rollo. Do you know what they told me? Uh, Mr. Durant, I can explain. They told me you were taking a 5% bonus on all our drug shipments. That was nothing, Mr. Durant. Edward, mm -hmm. how long was I in my coma? 878 days, 12 hours and 16 minutes, Mr. Durant. 800 days, two shipments a week, each shipment worth, say, $10 million on the street, minus the problems with the exchange rate. What do you say that might add up to, Edward? $27,280,000, 17 cents. Buckle up! No! No! Where's my fucking money? I came and begged commerce, Mr. Durant. I've got an account there. Oh, I was gonna tell you. It was gonna be a surprise. Oh, I'm surprised. Can't you tell? <laughs> and now I have a surprise for you. No! Always replace your divots, Rollo. Incidentally, this film also stars Renee O'Connor, better known as Gabrielle from Xena Warrior Princess, as a girl whose brother was killed by Durant and wants to help Darkman take him down. Then there's Darkman 3, Die, Darkman, Die. Now that's a fucking title. In this one, another gangster, played by Jeff Fay, wants to steal the secret of Darkman's super strength. And that's pretty much it. There is some business about Darkman impersonating the guy and momentarily feeling sorry for him since the guy has a wife and daughter, but it's nowhere near as good as part two. In fact, this one plays more like an episode of a TV series than a three-act movie. Both of these were released in a DVD box set along with the original film, for a pretty fair price. 
definitely worth picking up if you ask me. Now as far as the comic books go, there's a lot of good ones, but the one I feel most comfortable recommending is Darkman vs. the Army of Darkness. Yes, you heard me right. The Necronomicon Ex Mortis brings Robert G. Durant back from the grave, so Darkman must find a way to take him down. So he has to team up with the only living expert on the Necronomicon, Ash Williams. Groovy. Fanboys and fangirls, this is my all-time favorite crossover. While it may not be the first time Sam Raimi characters have crossed over, as far as I'm concerned, this is still the best. Buckle up, bonehead. This time, it's forever. Final verdict. Darkman is one of those rare films that isn't a class of its own. It doesn't cater to your expectations, it's not lighthearted, and it doesn't pull any punches. There are so many great practical effects and beautiful makeup appliances that it is a feast to the eyes to any self-respected horror hound. Not to mention, Sam Raimi applied quite a few of those visual illusions that he is so well known for. Now that's awesome. As much as I'm looking forward to Sam Raimi's future blockbuster movies, I seriously wish that he would go back to doing stuff like this. 10 points on the badassitude meter! If it's daytime, set your timer to 99 minutes and give it a watch. And now, I leave you with the greatest final ship ever! Join the Legion, suckers! You made me look real bad. You could do worse. Ah! Run, coward, run! <laughs>